welcome to Town Meeting TV. Um, this is another program in our series of election programming. We are in the midst of a uh, the beginnings of the general election. It's sort of already kicked off in a way. Um, yes, the filing period is open right now. Great. Um, and we're here with the Vermont Secretary of State, Sarah Copeland Hansis. And welcome. And tell us, you're a year and a half into this um, term and what's it been like for you? It has been super busy, um, you know, as if running an 80-person operation uh, isn't busy enough. Uh, we've, we've had a few extra tasks that we've undertaken and, uh, and then, of course, the flood. So, um, you know, when I came in, uh, I knew that we had three major IT builds that we needed to do. And uh, that means continuing to do all of the work of the agency while your staff is busy with the developers to, uh, to figure out how we're going to build this new system. Um, all of these systems uh, came into being right around the same time about a dozen years ago. And, and what so, were the systems? So we have our election management system, um, campaign finance and lobbying, and then also our business services system. So all of those teams are busy meeting with the developers and uh, busy looking at ways that we can make the new system work a little bit better, um, a little more customer friendly, a little a little less quirky. The, the systems that we have currently are great, um, but, but uh, you know, they're a dozen years old. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, brings us, the Secretary of State's office has a pretty wide breadth of yes. what it's managing mm -hmm. as, a, as an office for the state of Vermont. Maybe just give us the quick, yeah. what do you do? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, a wide variety of things, and they all, they all happen to, to have some common threads to them. Um, so we run the Office of Professional Regulation, which licenses or certifies, um, you know, any number of different professionals. We have about 80,000 Vermonters that we uh, interact with on a semi-annual basis for their professional license. Uh, with that comes um, investigation and enforcement if someone is, uh, is alleged to have been um, acting unprofessionally. Um, we, we do that investigation. Anything, anything and from a doctor to an architect to a roofer to a, to a tattoo artist yeah. or a barber or a yeah. cosmetologist, yeah, you name it. Um, so that division is uh, our busiest division, uh, our largest division. We've got about 40 people in that division. Um, next in terms of size is the state archives. So we have, um, you know, a, a huge warehouse in Middlesex that is floor to ceiling boxes of um, paperwork that you know, documents that, that tell the history of Vermont all the way back, uh, you know, to our original hand-scripted constitution uh, and right up into the digital files that are being transmitted to the archives today. And so we serve state government uh, in terms of taking in records that need to be retained and, and uh, making them available to the agencies or departments when they need them. Uh, and we also serve the public, so you can come and do genealogy research, you can look back through uh, newspapers that have been in print in Vermont for, uh, you know, for 150 years. So it's a really, uh, it's a wonderful treasure trove of, yeah. of information. Um, we have our business services division that uh, registers every corporation and nonprofit in the state. And yeah. so we have a, a, a number of touch points within our business services to every single business that needs to get their, uh, their annual uh, registration. And then our small but mighty elections team that is, yeah. uh, that is responsible for administering all uh, statewide and federal elections and training and equipping the clerks who are serving in their town or city across the state who actually do the local elections administration. And then we have three step special programs that I like to talk about as well. We've got our Safe at Home program, which is an address confidentiality program for victims of um, stalking, domestic violence, or human trafficking. And the legislature expanded that to uh, include uh, health care providers and recipients in, in certain kinds of protected health care classes. So that gives us a whole new population of people who may not be aware that this program even exists or may not have heard that it now uh, is something that they could take advantage of yep. to have their mail forwarded to them so that they don't have to put their physical address in uh, official documents and, and on um, 
in a, out in the public. Uh, out there in yep. the public. Yep. Um, we have a temporary officiants program, so Vermont is a wonderful destination for people to get married. Um, cool. But if you yep. want to come to Vermont to get married and you uh, and you want your, you know, your aunt Susan to perform the marriage ceremony, um, Susan needs to get a temporary officiants license. Neat. And then our, uh, our last special program, which I hope we'll dive into a little bit more, is our civics program. So education and outreach um, around how to do democracy in 2024. Yeah. And that's really what we're here today to talk about mm -hmm. is the election year. Yeah. So the election elections are one way that Vermonters can actually start to get involved and touch their government mm -hmm. through at least uh, the election process. Um, so walk us through a typical election year and how this is going to be a different year than yeah. others. Yeah. So this year is going to be, um, I think, a more interesting <laughs> election year maybe than the midterms were two years ago in some ways because there is such heightened rhetoric around uh, the office of the presidency. Um, and typically, even when there isn't heightened rhetoric, um, there are more people who tend to get tuned into politics and tuned into who's running and making a plan for voting when it is a presidential election year. Even though, honestly, it is our March elections, which are our local, you know, yeah. your, your town or city or your school elections, those are the ones that really have a, a more direct impact on your day-to-day -day life. Um, but but so many people get tuned in when they hear yeah. about the Run, run for president. Yeah. yeah, so just to, like like give us that quick sketch of the March elections, the local elections, and then the general, what we call the general elections, which yes. happen every two years mm -hmm. in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Give us that quick sketch, civics yes. lesson. Yeah. So every single year in March, um, every town and city uh, and every school district have to adopt their annual budget and um, elect uh, any officers, your school board members, your select board, your city council. So that's going to happen every March, and uh, and those elections really roll out um, in sort of a mosaic because some communities still adopt their town or city budget by a floor vote. Um, some school districts still adopt their school budget by a floor vote. In fact, when I leave here, I'm going to get in my car and drive back to Bradford so that I can participate in my uh, school annual meeting. Is, it, is that because it got rejected the first time no, around, no, or is this, this, is, this is it? We are a union school district, and we've always done ours sort of on the tail end of, of when uh, school districts um, yep. typically adopt their budget. Uh, so March, some communities have chosen to mail every single ballot if they have a ballot vote for their March meetings. Other communities, you have to request a ballot, and then still other communities, as I said, are doing their vote in person on the floor um, at, a, at an actual meeting. Uh, August primary is, um, is our opportunity to decide who's going to be on our November ballot. And so we, this year, will be voting for everything from president and vice president uh, all the way through our statewide office holders, so treasurer, uh, secretary of state, auditor, uh, attorney general. And, uh, and we're starting, we're deciding in August on the political the, parties. The, which, yes, yeah. which, which candidate is going to represent their party in the November election. Yeah. And um, all 30 senators, all 150 House members, uh, the county level office of high bailiff, mm -hmm. and also at your local level, you'll be voting for your, um, uh, in November, excuse me, November you'll be voting for your justice of the peace. There isn't a primary for, for JP. Um, and so the August primary looks different than the presidential primary. And, and back in March, I was reminding people of this and, and people still to forget that when we vote on the presidential primary, you have to declare which ballot you want to vote. They don't give you both of them yeah. in March. Yeah. In August, when you show up for the polls, you'll be handed three ballots because we have three major parties in Vermont. So you'll be handed the Republican, the Democrat, and the Progressive ballot. And you can take all three into the voting booth with you, decide which one you want to vote, and turn the other two in and put, and put your ballot into the tabulator. If you request uh, a ballot be mailed to you for August, you'll get all three ballots in the mail and you have to return all three of them um, because that's how we keep track to make sure that we don't have extra ballots out there that, uh, that, that 
could fall into the wrong yep, hands. Other hands yep. yeah. how, does a, uh, how does a party get recognized as a major party? Yeah, so there's a, a threshold that's set in statute. Um, it involves uh, being organized in a certain number of communities. Organized means uh, you and I live in the same community. We decide we're going to start the only wear gray on Tuesday's party, and, uh, and, and we declare ourselves a party. But then we have to get people in a certain number of other communities and in a certain number of counties to organize as well. And then to maintain a major party status, um, there has to be a certain number of votes cast for, uh, for, for a member of that party in your general election. Yeah. yeah. And are, at this point, are the, are the records showing that the Democrats, the Republicans, and the progressives have solid uh, political party status? So we see really low participation rates um, in the progressive primary. Yeah. Um, and, and that may be because there just aren't that many contested primary um, races on yeah. the progressive ballot. Uh, so that is a little bit concerning, particularly when we look at the fact that, you know, we, we have to print 300,000 or more copies of that primary ballot uh, to, to cover the anticipated turnout. Yeah. And if only thousand are ever being cast in that primary it, it's sort of begs the question of whether we should print that many because most of them end up in mm -hmm. the recycling yep. um, but the the law of the state right now has those thresholds set in it and um, and and so we have three parties yeah you mentioned the term statute and all of the the things that we're talking about in terms of elections are buried in the statutes that yes. are um, made by the legislature mm -hmm. and then the Secretary of State's office. What is, tell us a little bit about the role of the Secretary of State in relationship to protecting elections and yeah. um, promoting democracy. Yeah, so Title 17 is the uh, elections title and uh, we, we keep a very careful eye on that, especially if there's proposals to change it because we have a very close relationship with the town and city clerks who have to administer elections on the local level. So we really feel strongly that we wanna make sure that any changes that are coming to election law are ones that we can administer and that our local uh, town and city clerks can administer, um, and uh, and so you know we really are just uh, executing the laws that have been passed by uh, by the the legislature. But as far as our role in um, in protecting democracy, you know I see this um, right alongside one of our other very important roles, in that the, if not the Secretary of State, then who's gonna do it, right? So the Secretary of State has uh, a very central role to play in terms of government accountability and transparency uh, because of our archives, as we talked about before. We are the, the keeper of the information about what your government has done on your behalf. And we are also uh, very frequently the, the source of information that, uh, that other government entities come to for information about how to comply with open meeting law and how to comply with the Public Records Act. And so uh, we see democracy as being right up there with transparency and accountability in terms of the, the job that our office needs to hold very closely. So protecting democracy really means making sure that Vermonters know how to do democracy, right? You don't necessarily need to be able to memorize the preamble to the Constitution or, you know, or, or rattle off, you know, from memory what a high bailiff does. Um, but we think, I think, that protecting democracy is, uh, is essential, it is essential for Vermonters to know how to use their democracy to accomplish the things that they think need to be changed in the world. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know how to uh, petition your government for change, if you don't know how to uh, peacefully protest something that you see going wrong in the world, um, if you don't know how to vote, <laughs> how can you be participating in democracy? Yeah, and that brings, I mean, elections are one piece of supporting and promoting democracy. Um, and how are you seeing elections under attack, if at all, in Vermont. I mean, we've heard a lot about misinformation, 
um, people, local officials being um, mm -hmm. attacked by people around, um, you know, is, is, are we seeing that happening in Vermont? Sadly, we are, yeah. Tell, and tell us a little bit about that. So, um, you know, as we see heightened rhetoric um, and, and partisan divides um, getting deeper, um, people have forgotten how to disagree with each other without uh -huh. being disagreeable. Um, and that has led to some, some fairly intense experiences that some of our local elections officials and even the folks who work at the Secretary of State's office have had, um, you know, just with people lashing out if they don't understand the political process and the electoral process. So this whole nonsense about the 2020 election being stolen really comes from a place of not understanding how our elections work in the first place and how we know they're safe. And so what I always say to people is if you don't think your elections are safe, you need to go and spend a couple hours at your clerk's office and, and have them walk you through all of the work that they do to update their voter registration checklist so that we know that the people who are on it are people who are currently living in that community. Uh, what are all the steps that they go through to track a ballot when it leaves their office out in the mail or comes back? And then how do they check off and make sure that somebody isn't voting in person after they've mailed in their ballot? Um, all of the procedures that, that our local city and town clerks follow are, are designed to make sure that we know our elections are safe and secure. So there's a lot of uh, mis and disinformation out there. But then there are also malicious actors. And so we are focused right now on making sure that our town and city clerks have um, uh, updated cybersecurity training. You know, what is the basic cyber hygiene that you need to follow in order to be sure that, you, uh, that your computer systems are safe? Um, what are the de-escalation tactics that you might use if someone comes into your office or shows up on election day in an agitated state? And, um, and thirdly, you know, what are some of the basic physical security improvements that, that maybe are um, you know, pretty straightforward to someone who focuses on physical security but might not be the top of mind to someone who's showing up every day to record land records and, uh, and, and you know, execute elections and um, give out marriage uh, licenses yeah. and all of that. So uh, all of those physical security, cybersecurity, and de-escalation tactics are ones that we think is important to invest in for our local elections officials and, and frankly, for the staff at the Secretary of State's office as well. Yeah. So what else, what, tell us a little bit, are you hearing from the clerks that this, this support is helpful, useful? Are you hearing from them? You know, what, what do they need? Yeah, so you know, what they tell me is, uh, is voters are often confused, right? Um, I, I heard a story from a clerk in, uh, in March who had had a very angry interaction and, and she said she thought that she might be struck by this angry voter who was just sure that he had never had to tell anybody which ballot he wanted to vote in the presidential primary. And, uh, and no amount of calm explanation that she gave him about how long this has been the case uh, was going to back him down. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there, there certainly are lots of instances where local clerks uh, appreciate that. And, and they appreciate being able to show someone, this is the law of Vermont. I didn't make this up because I wanted to give you a hard time today. This is actually the law. Yeah. And uh, sometimes that works to, to de-escalate people. Yeah. So we want to make sure they're well equipped with yeah. all of that information. And the Secretary of State has done a lot to help, um, well, the state of Vermont certainly has done a lot to help in, um, Sort of grease the wheels for voter participation, same mm -hmm. day voter registration, mm -hmm. re voter registration when you sign up with the DMV. Talk to us a little bit about how Vermont is different than kind of the prevailing winds of election participation around the country. Yeah. So, you know, my predecessor, uh, Secretary Condos, used to say, um, and I really appreciate this, that, uh, that the true voter fraud is denying a person's right to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in Vermont, we have very, uh, very careful consideration of 
um, of our election statutes, but they are very focused on uh, enabling participation. We don't deny someone the right to vote if they've been convicted of a felony, and, and in many states, uh, voters are denied the ability to influence uh, who's going to, to lead them. Um, we, as you said, have, uh, have very um, good voter registration uh, laws so that you can show up on election day and register to vote. Okay. Um, and the universal vote by mail that was so popular when we did it in an emergency basis in 2020 is now the, the, the law of Vermont for every general election. So in November, your ballot will come in the mail to you, which is why I always want to remind people um, if you've moved or if your mailing address has changed, go to your My Voter page and just check, double check, uh, update your mailing address, switch your registration to the community that you live in now uh, if you've moved recently. Uh, and that just helps us make sure that your ballot gets to you. Great. Um, and we'll have a, a short um, announcement from you about that yes. at the end of this interview. Um, talking about participation, what does mm -hmm. Vermont's voter participation rate look like? And have these measures had an impact? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that the universal vote by mail uh, in 2020 must have had an impact because our presidential participation rate in 2020 was 74% of the population. 74% of the population are registered voters. Seven, well, 74% of the Re registered voters. voters. Yes. Okay. Yes. But still, we, yeah. We don't count kids against us. They're yeah, not yeah. old enough to vote yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that compares to 68% uh, in 2016 and 65% uh, in 2012. So yeah. uh, what I'll be interested to see is this year, uh, our second ever uh, presidential election with universal vote by mail, can we get close to that 75%? Yeah. Um, but our participation rate across other elections is really sort of highs and lows. And um, I think people's participation in March um, tends to, to be dependent on whether they are really clued into something big that's going on in their own community or if there's a hotly contested presidential primary that year. Then we see those participation rates coming up a little bit. And, and Vermont's participation rate in the presidential primary this year was 28%, which is a far short of the 74% that we saw in the 2020 general election. Um, and we, uh, we also fell short of New Hampshire. They had 45% participation rate. But of course, New Hampshire is the first in the nation, right? Yeah. So they get, yeah. they get a lot of Attention. visits from uh, presidential candidates. Um, and all of the candidates who are on their ballot are still in the race. By yeah. the time the primary gets to us at the beginning of March, uh, many of those candidates have um, have suspended their campaigns and yeah. so it tends to to be a little less exciting uh, we did uh, beat some of the other new england states uh, maine at 16 percent turnout massachusetts at 26 percent turnout uh, rhode island at five percent turnout in wow. their presidential primary wow. i'm guessing theirs must be a little bit later in the process and yep. once the primary feels like it's already been resolved um, it's not as motivating shall we say yeah um, the, the, the situation with participation and the general election, um, what, what do we need to do to improve that? Well, I think, um, I think one of the reasons that people don't vote is that they don't know how to vet those candidates that are on their ballot. They, they don't know how to find out more information about them. Uh, which is why in our civics program, we will be creating our first ever universal voter guide for the general election. And on your My Voter page, uh, when your general election ballot arrives, you'll be able to go on and find your uh, voter guide that'll have all of the candidates from the top of the ballot down uh, to just shy of JP, because we haven't quite figured out how to do all of those local JP um, voter guide yeah. pieces, but you'll be able to go on, you'll be able to see who's running for state rep, who's running for state senator, who's running for auditor or 
Secretary of State or Governor. And you'll be able to see a bio, you know, a, a, a short blurb from that candidate. You know, who are you? Why are you running for this office? You'll be able to find their website, their social media handles. So you can use that entire 45-day time period that you have your ballot to research the candidates and find the candidate who you think is going to do the best job for yeah. that for yeah. that race. And I'm hoping with that additional information and that and and now you have that whole time with your ballot. Uh, on your kitchen table that more people will make sure that they cast their ballot and make their their voice heard. Yeah. Is that a tool that you could see rolling out to clerks on a local level for local I elections? I would love to be able to do yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. And it, it all depends on how we build it. You know, what technology, what platform are we going to use? Yeah. If we can build um, a, a, a platform that is easily um, transferable to the locals, I think it would be a powerful tool for uh, for city council races, for select board races, yeah. um, so that people really feel empowered to vote. Because it's hard when you show up and you don't recognize the names that are yeah. on your ballot. It's How do you know who to vote way. for? Yeah, it's a certainly a different way of getting at campaign finance reform if you're giving people at least a place. I mean, you know, something like um, the Vermont Access Network and see, you know, what we do here at Town Meeting TV, providing a, a seat at the table for local election mm -hmm. officials so that, mm -hmm. you know, a lo local candidates, yeah. and it may be one of the only times that you ever meet them unless they come to your door. Right. Um, that's a lot of door knocking for some, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. communities, but. Absolutely. Um, you know, the other thing that we keep hearing from this uh, presidential election is around misinformation mm -hmm. and the use of AI and both nefarious misinformation and then just the sort of general social media sharing of um, you know, I heard this, my cousin told me this thing, and then passing it around and, it, and becoming amplified. Tell us a little bit about what we might be seeing in Vermont so far yeah. in those realms. Yeah, well, you know, I think what's important for people to remember is if you read something on social media or on a website that someone shared through social media that doesn't seem right or doesn't sound familiar, uh, always come to the Secretary of State's website to double check. We have a page that is myths versus facts, so hmm. you can okay. uh, jump on your favorite search engine and, and type in VTSOS myth versus fact, and uh, you can get a whole bunch of information there about, uh, about how our elections are working. In New Hampshire, during the presidential primary, there was a, a, an AI fake call that sounded like President Biden's voice telling people not to vote in the Democratic primary. Hold your vote, save your vote for November. Hmm. That's, that's the kind of um, you know, meddling that we're seeing now in elections. And, um, and so we just wanna make sure that people know that it is a possibility and that you do have a place to turn for the correct information. And have you had any reports of that in Vermont at this? Has, has anybody contacted the Secretary of State's office with complaints or reports? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. And, but we have had some proactive legislators coming to us and saying, hey, we should get out ahead of this. And yeah. so I expect that we'll have a proposal next year that will um, require uh, the disclosure of anything that was AI generated in campaign material yeah. um, now whether that's going to catch the, the types of um, bad actors that, that put forward that call in New Hampshire, I don't know. Yeah, and start. that's a direct, you know, the use of AI and deep fake. But then the, the other piece, which has to do maybe with more media literacy education, mm -hmm. you know, when you say, if it doesn't sound right, sometimes things do sound right. Yeah. And that's how they sort of continue to spread, is right. people go like, well, it sounds right to me. It yeah. makes sense. Um, tell us a little bit, and maybe this is part of your civics program, maybe it's not, mm -hmm. about the initiative um, to promote involvement in elections and voting and just general dem democracy. Yeah. So the civics program uh, has been in existence now for a little over a year. Uh, we have a number of projects that are going all at the same time, and uh, our our civics coordinator is amazing at juggling. I think she should be in the circus. This is Robin, <laughs> She's Robin Palmer. Palmer. Yes, Palmer. She's doing a fabulous job. Um, so she is working on Vermont's first ever civic health index. 
Now this is a, a, a program that is, uh, that is brought to Vermont from the National uh, Council on Citizenship. And uh, it's been done in 30-something other states around the country. This will be our first. And basically what we're doing here is we're taking uh, the supplemental census data and bringing in a whole bunch of other partner organizations who have more data and other data. And we're trying to build a picture of who participates. In, and this is a very broad uh, definition of civics. It's not just whether you vote. Yep. The, it's a broad definition. Do you, uh, do you serve on a local board? Have you been to a local board meeting? Um, do you volunteer for any community organizations? Uh, do you help your neighbor? Uh, so, sort of a, a very broad look at who's connected in their communities in that way. And what I'm hoping that we'll get out of this is um, a sort of a roadmap to where we need to focus our attentions on civic engagement going forward. Um, so this year, while we're doing the Civic Health Index study and, uh, and writing up the report, we also happen to be busy outreaching on participating in the 2024 elections. So that's keeping us busy for right now. But in future years, you know, where are the places in Vermont where people tend to be less connected to their community? And who are the populations of people? You know, what are their demographics who are not as likely to be involved? And then let's figure out how we reach those groups. And with our many partner organizations, um, I have no doubt that we're going to have a really robust conversation on how we do that outreach into communities. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see, like, where are the tensions? What, I mean, are you already starting to see some of that data come together in terms of, like, where are the tensions? What gets in the way yeah. of community participation, volunteerism? I mean, obvious ones like racism, classism, um, capitalism, Yep. How, how are we going to talk about those pieces right, of this? Right. I, I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there because, uh, you know, people who are working two or three jobs and have small kids probably not can have a lot of extra time to serve on a board or volunteer. Yep. Um, and some of those people are the people who we have trouble uh, encouraging to come out and vote as well. Yeah. And um, so it'll be uh, up to us then to take that data and, and figure out what to do with it. Um, one of the interesting things is when you get that supplemental census data, it, it shows you where your state ranks uh, relative to other states. And we were, we were ranked number two in one of the categories. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. But when we dug a little deeper and looked at what's the percentage of Vermonters who do the thing that they were asking, we were at 17 percent. Okay. So if you can be at 17 percent on a marker of civic engagement, that's a lot of room for improvement, yeah. regardless of whether you happen to be ranked number two in the nation. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can share that information with local groups who are frankly looking for people to participate. Um, and, and maybe it sparks a two-way conversation. How do we invite people to step up and, and get more involved and how do we invite groups to, uh, to, to make their organization the place that people want to come and get involved. Great. Well, um, I think that we're, we covered a lot here and the, you know, the main thing is that you know, gearing up, I mean, maybe just give us the dates of what's coming up yes. just to circle back on the election right. season that we're entering into. Yes, so we are definitely uh, in the thick of it in our office right now because candidates are coming in right now to file their paperwork. Major party candidates have to file by the end of May to get on the ballot for the August primary. And once we have all of those candidates in, we work on proofing all of those different ballots because in Vermont we have uh, about 350 different ballot styles depending on what Senate district and what state rep district and what county you're in. Um, and then the primary is on August 13th. Primary is Tuesday, August 13th. You, if you would like a ballot in the mail, you need to pop onto your My Voter page or call your clerk and ask for your ballot to be mailed to you. They're available 45 days ahead of time. And then after the primary, we'll have the general election in November. The general election, you will get your ballot automatically, but we recommend you double check, update your address on your My Voter page. Great. And that'll be um, generally, it's all voting seven to seven all day long if you don't vote by mail ahead of yes. time or drop off your yep. ballot with the clerk's office. Um, thanks so much for sharing 
sharing it uh, with us this information about how people can be involved and what your the Secretary of State's office is doing around uh, political participation. Um, stay tuned here, Town Meeting TV, for more programming. We're all about civics and participation. Um, and we will have election forums actually for the primaries starting in July. And um, thanks for watching. <laughs>